morning. Uh, yo, to tell you about what I do for a living is interesting. Uh, my boss is going to be here tomorrow, so I have to make sure that this doesn't get out. Um, no, seriously, my, my job is very simple. Um, I pray in the morning and ask God what I should do, and then I try to do exactly what he's asked me to do. Uh, it's a little more difficult than that, obviously. But I think that is the, the gist of what Janike and I are doing uh, in Johannesburg. Uh, I think next week marks the 23 years since we arrived in Johannesburg. So we've been here 23 years, starting 24 years. Uh, I think it's next Saturday, uh, right before the box beat uh, France. So <laughs> what a great celebration that will be. Um, yeah, so we work downtown. We work in the inner city. We work in uh, basically Yeovil, Berea, Makers Valley, those kind of places. We work amongst people and nations that don't normally naturally hear or love the gospel. Um, so yeah, if you ever want to go on a prayer walk or see that part of the city, uh, let me know. Uh, Janet Kay and I chase good coffee shops all over this place and uh, if nothing else, we'll have a great cup of coffee and, and pray for what God is doing in that place. Uh, I love the songs that we sang this morning. Uh, the one line from an earlier song that said, my confidence is in your faithfulness. Uh, that's a great way for me to describe what I do for a living. And uh, my confidence is not in anything I do or am, but it's in who God is and what he does. The sermon today from Acts 7 basically to sum it up, the last song does a great job. It is all about the presence of God. And it really is a debated thing, uh, obviously, in chapter 7. Uh, but if you'll remember, oh, let me say this before I start. Uh, since this is a 247 church, it's a church that has been praying in 247 in the afternoon. There's probably a few really godly people that pray at 247 in the morning. We are going to have an end of the year uh, all Joburg Pretoria gathering uh, at Every Nation in Rosebank at 7 o'clock on Thursday, November the 7th. Uh, if you would like to be a part of that, that would thrill me. So if you, if you want to get together with people from all over Gauteng uh, and pray for this city, uh, that, that's going to be an opportunity for you. Okay, so last week I wasn't here. Uh, you guys went over Acts chapter 6, and you studied a man named Stephen. And just to summarize that, in case you were not here last week, he is a man full of grace and power. He is a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He is a man who, as he served as a deacon, the word of God continued to spread, and a number of disciples continued to grow. He, he is a man who performed great wonders and signs. And he is a man who, uh, with an apologist kind of a, a bent, uh, as he spoke, it says they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit. So today we're going to continue the story of Stephen in, in Acts chapter 7. And we're going to see most of these attributes uh, happen as he defends the gospel, right? He doesn't defend himself at all. He defends the gospel. And I think for us to look at Acts 7 is important. Max Lucado said one time, almost every day provides us with small and large opportunities to trust in and reach for Jesus. So today's sermon, I, don't, I didn't do this on purpose, I promise. I'm not that kind of guy, but they all start with an S. Uh, Stephen was seized. Stephen preaches a sermon, which, by the way, is the longest sermon in Acts, so we may be here for a while. If you're getting your car washed, uh, yo, um, it's all my fault. Blame me. Uh, then we're going to talk about Stephen gets stoned. Uh, for those of you all that are children of the 70s, it's not that kind of stoned. Uh, it's not what happens when I walk the streets of Yeovil every single day. Um, and then Saul is introduced, who will continue in the rest of Acts, and then finally Stephen sleeps. So I thought it'd be really cute uh, and titled this sermon, a sermon that puts him to sleep, but there's a lot in that. So why does Stephen do this sermon? Well, basically the high priests asked him a question and they said, is this true? So the question that they're asking him is basically, are you speaking blasphemous words about Moses and about God? 
right? So blasphemy is like to curse, to revile, to despise. They're saying the way you're talking about God and the law and the temple despises God. You're not glorifying God. You're not honoring God. You're doing something completely different. They're asking him, have you said these things against the holy place, the temple and the law? And the last thing they're kind of asking him to defend is, is Jesus really going to change the customs of Moses that were handed down to us? And I think it's important for us as we just start to look at this in Acts 7-2, we see Stephen talk about the glorious God. And the last thing we see in Acts 7.55 is the glory of God. So the book ends of this sermon, of this chapter, is the glory of God, right? And so a simple outline uh, in verses 2 to 50 is the clarification of the historical events, right? So Stephen is basically saying, you're confused. Let me explain to you what really happened because you don't really get this as well as you should. And then in verses 51 and 54, the, the culmination is Jesus. Now, this, this starts well. Uh, Stephen starts talking about brothers and fathers. It's very cordial. It's very warm. It's very respectful. And then in the storyline, Stephen defense is straight is traced through the old testament heroes the heroes of our faith right and he starts with abraham so let me read to you verses two through seven stephen replied listen brothers and fathers the glorious god appeared to our ancestor abraham when he was in mesopotamia before he settled in haran and he said to them leave your country And your relatives and go to the land I will show you. So he left the country of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And then after the death of his father, God had him move to this country where you are now. He gave him no property in it, not even a foot of land. And he promised to give it to him and his descendants after him as a permanent possession. Even though he had no child. This is what God promised. His descendants would be strangers in a foreign country, and its people would enslave them and oppress them for 400 years. But I will punish the nations they serve, said God, and afterwards they will leave and worship me in this place. One of Stephen's points is that God has always been with his people. His presence has continually been with his people. So as we look at Abraham and and Moses and all the heroes that we're going to see today, we need to see that Stephen is building a case that God didn't just show up at the temple in Jerusalem. He's been there the whole time, right? From creation, he has continually been. The bottom line is God didn't wait for the temple to be with his people. So as we look at each character, we're going to talk about where. Where was God when this happened, right? And so in this section with Abraham, God was in Mesopotamia. He was actually pre-Mesopotamia and then into Haran and now into the country that the Israelites now possess. So what do we learn historically? What is the relationship like? What, 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 are, what are their hearts towards God? How do they act? What do they do? What do we learn about them as Stephen says, this is who they are. This is who you are. So in verse 6, God promised that they would be strangers in this foreign country and that they would be enslaved and oppressed. One of the things we need to understand about the Israelites is that they are continually slaved, enslaved and oppressed, right? That they are strangers in that country. But more importantly, in verse 7, what do we learn about God? Right? What's the character of God that we see in this whole sermon that Stephen is preaching? What is the character of God? What, what did the Jews miss as they built their ideology of where they were theologically? In verse 7, it says, God desires their worship. So we're thinking about God in this story. We're thinking about a God that desires the worship of the Israelites. And then lastly, as we go through East Jackson, we'll talk about Jesus. There are a lot of similarities between what we see in this 
message and who Jesus is and what he did. When you think about people that were sent to a very distant place to live as a foreigner, Jesus should come to the top of your mind. At Christmas time, we celebrate the fact that he left heaven and came to earth and was not really adored and loved uh, while he walked on this planet. All right, so that's Abraham. He talks quickly in verse uh, 9, 8 and 9, about Isaac, Jacob, and the patriarchs. And it says this, He gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and he became the father of Isaac, circumcising him on the eighth day. Then Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him in, as a slave into Egypt. However, God was with him. So historically, the Israelites were a jealous people. They were so jealous that, that Stephen points out that they actually sold a family member into slavery. That's pretty jealous. There's days I didn't get along with my brother or my sister, but I don't think I'd ever thought about selling them into slavery. I don't think I could get much for them, but that may be as part of the deal. I hope they're not listening to this. Okay. So that's who they were, but who was God? It says that God was with them. Remember the last song, the presence of the Lord is in this place, right? So as bad as things were for, for Joseph, his family treated him miserably. God was with him, right? And don't take this for granted. This is going to be the theme of this entire sermon. So Jesus, what does this have to do with Jesus? Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. So it's, it's as if the Old Testament it keeps showing you more and more and more about Jesus and building this case, right? So easy for us to come today and look back at the Old Testament, more difficult than it was for the spiritual leaders in that time and place to figure it out. But uh, hopefully we can get there together. The next character we talk about is Joseph. And from nine, uh, verses 9 to 16, we see this. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him as a slave into Egypt. God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He allowed him to win favor and to show wisdom before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who has appointed him the ruler of Egypt and of his whole household. But a famine spread throughout Egypt and Canaan, and with a great suffering, our ancestors couldn't find any food. But when Jacob heard there was grain in Egypt, he set out, he sent our ancestors on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent him word and invited his father Jacob and all the relatives to come to him. Seventy-five persons in all. So Jacob went down to Egypt. He and his ancestors died. And they were brought back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of money and the sons of Hamar in Shechem. Joseph is a key character. Abraham is a huge character. And the next major, major character is Joseph. So where do we find Joseph in the story of the Old Testament that Stephen is presenting to the religious leaders of the day? We find Joseph in Egypt, right? Now, what do we learn about the Israelites? We learn that they were slaves, that they were suffering, and believe it or not, that they, schemed, that they were schemed against, so much so that they were forced to kill their children. We'll see that again um, in, in Moses. The point I want you to see is that, that their faith, because of their faith or lack of it, it affected other people's faith, right? God can use it for good as he did uh, with Joseph. So we see four important things about God uh, in Joseph in verses 9, 10, and 14. The first one we see in verse 9 is that God is with him. The second thing is that God rescued him. When we think about God, we need to understand that he is a rescuing God. Many of us could give testimony of where we would be today if it wasn't for the Lord coming into our life and bringing us into his family. And then it says God allowed him to win favor. 
God will bless and use people to accomplish his will. And here we see Joseph with favor of the ruling party in Egypt. And he has uh, the ability, because of what God showed him in a dream, to save enough grain that the, that the whole country survived. Um, the word I um, can't figure out when they don't eat. Uh, their starvation. Uh, verse 14. God invites his people to come to him. If you want to sum up who God is, famine is the word. Yes, famine. God invites his people to come to him. We sang this morning about God being a creator and God being so amazing. And yet he's not a distant God. He is a God whose presence is obvious. And God invites people continually to come and be with him. What do we learn about Jesus if we think about Joseph? That he was also rejected. He was also sold for silver, and yet he became our rescuer. Now, I'm at a difficult part in this sermon because Moses in the verses in the Bible is about 35 verses, and I don't think you want me to read 35 verses. So I'm going to take it that you'll go home today and read those verses. So I'll just give you the highlights. Moses... Uh, and wh where do we find Moses in the story of the Old Testament? There's, you can kind of look at it if they put it up there, but uh, it'll take a while to read. We find Moses in so many different places. In fact, if you remember when, when the charges were brought against Stephen, they said you have offended Moses and God, almost in that order, right? Moses is high and lifted up. He's one of the greatest people in the Old Testament in the Jewish faith, <clears throat> And so we see Moses doing quite a bit. In fact, this text is broken down into this 40 years, this 40 years, and this 40 years. Uh, if you're bad in math, that means he was at least 120 years old. So we follow Moses from Egypt to the Red Sea, to the desert, to the wilderness, to Mount Sinai. Moses is instrumental in many parts of the things that happen uh, with the people of Israel. But how do we sum them up historically? We would say that they are disobedient, they are impatient, and they delight in the works of their hands. And though that's true, God rescues them. God rescued Moses when he was a baby. You know that story, he's in the basket of reeds and Pharaoh's daughter gets him. And that then in the next time, the next phase of, Jesus, of Moses' life, God calls him and sends him. And then the third stage, kind of sum it up, is that God uses him powerfully, right? So the first 40 years, he is saved from certain death. The Israelites at this point in time are told to put their children outside and, and let them die so they don't become a great nation, a populous nation. And so we see Moses get adopted. We see him get provided for. We see him get education. He is a man that learns how to speak well and to uh, do many deeds. He takes a lot of action, right? He is, he's kind of like a superhero. He's a, a reconciler, an avenger, a defender. Um, and yet, even though he was a reconciler, he was rejected by his people when he turned 40 he flees and lives in a foreign land another uh, abrahamic kind of thing that happened and yet while he's there he appears before the burning bush and god uh, calls him and sends him god says something that's very important for us to see here uh, and god says he has seen their oppression and he has heard their groans I don't know what kind of week you've had, but somebody in this room has probably had a week where they doubt that God hears them. They doubt that God understands what's going on. But I want you to understand, according to the Bible, according to the Word of God, He hears our groans and He sees our oppression. The last 40 years of Moses' life is amazing. He says, it, there's a verse in here that as you read it, you can go over it or you can stop. And it just says he spoke with angels. Now, I have a lot of pretty cool stuff on my resume. Speaking with angels is not something I've ever done, right? Moses spoke 
with angels. And on the Mount of Sinai, he received the living truth, the word of God, the law, the Torah. What an amazing man Moses was from being adopted as a baby to fleeing to a foreign land, to seeing a bush that doesn't burn, uh, to speaking with angels and, and doing the things he did. Moses was amazing. He is obviously a hero, and Stephen is, is, is dwelling on him to make points with the Israel, Israel's leaders at that time. So what do we see as we look at this story? What do we see about the Israelites? Well, I've already said they're disobedient, they're impatient, and they're delighted in the work of their hands. Mainly, that's making the golden calf. But I would also say that they rejected the teachings that God provided. And they refused to accept the deliverer that God provided. Moses jumps up. He tries to take his people and they say, who do you think you are? That's when he goes away to the desert. And the last thing I would say about the people is they worshiped a golden calf, which they made themselves. And then probably the scariest verse in this whole passage, it says God turned away from them. How frustrated God must have been, a God who is present with them, who loves them, uh, continually blesses them, and yet it says God turned away from them. One of the things I do like in this verse that is, is, is comforting and helpful is verse 21, that God adopted Moses. What a blessing for us to be adopted into the family of God. To be made part of his family. And then obviously in verse seven, 37, God rescues his people. So God is very active. God is obviously there. But we learn one thing about Jesus that I want to mention before we carry on. And that is this. Jesus was a reconciler, an avenger, a defender, and a rescuer who was rejected by his people. The next major portion of scripture is, is two verses in verses 44 and 45. And they're talking about the tent, the tent of meeting or the tabernacle, which, by the way, contained the Ark of the Covenant. And we see this. Our ancestors had the tent of testimony in the wilderness constructed just as the one who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors brought it here with Joshua when they replaced the nations that God drove out before the ancestors. And it was here until the time of David. And so they're talking now about the tabernacle. And, and this time we, we briefly meet Joshua, David, and Solomon. And we're in the desert, and then we're in the wilderness. There's a wandering, and the tabernacle is basically a tent. That they construct the way God told them to construct it, and then God made his presence known there. This is kind of a shift uh, for the Israelites, because at this point in time, they become obedient. They have just made and worshipped a golden calf, and now they're doing what God has asked them to do. And they built and construct, just as they were told, this tent, this place for God to meet them in worship. And then they actually take this ark to Jerusalem correctly. Uh, I don't want to talk long, but I, I remember Uzziah in 2 Samuel when he touched the ark improperly and was dead. And the, and the tent contains the Ark of the Covenant, which is symbolic in the place of God's presence, right? So we see God's presence so far in this text Pre, his presence predates the three pillars of Judaism. God's presence predates the law, right? Moses is on Sinai, but God has been with them since creation. He didn't just appear at Sinai with the law. He didn't just appear when they got to the promised land. He helped them get there, right? And he didn't wait to appear in the temple as the religious leaders are arguing with Stephen. In fact, he, they were there in the tent before the temple. God's whole, Stephen's whole point is that God has always been with you. It's not about that building. 
not only his presence, but his character. When God is present, so is God's love, so is God's provision, so is God's protection. So all the things that God is are present when he's present. Everything he is, everything he does are there. And verse 44 just proclaims again, God was with his people. I love this quote by John Stott. The God of Israel is a pilgrim God who is not restricted to any one place. He has pledged himself by a solemn covenant to be their God. And therefore, according to his covenant promises, wherever they are, there he is also. That should give us great peace today, to know that we are with God in a right relationship with God. We've been adopted into his family, however you want to say that. We are saved, if that's your word of choice. Wherever you are, if that's who you are, God is with you. And then in verse 45, it says, God drives out other nations. We, can, we see God just continually active in blessing the Israelites. Jesus, obviously, the, the easy way to think about Jesus is he is obedient. Everything Jesus does is to fulfill the word of God and to make sure that God's will is done. This leads us to verses 46 through 49. We'll talk about the temple briefly. He found favor with God and asked to design a dwelling for the house of Jacob. But it was Solomon, or that we're talking about David, but it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the most high God does not live in buildings made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house can you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is there in which I can rest? It was my hand that made all those things, wasn't it? That is a, a translation of Isaiah 66. So now, obviously, we're in Jerusalem, and the, the people build and construct this temple as they're told. David asked for the privilege of building the God's temple, and he is told, No, your hands are dirty, you're a warrior. You cannot do that. Your son Solomon will do that. Uh, there's many, many chapters in the Bible about how to build it, what to use, what it looks like, and it was, it was done. The materials were given, the craftsmen constructed, and the, the temple was built as it was. In ver verse 48, it says God appears in the temple, but it doesn't say God, all of God stays in the temple all the time. One of the things we know about God is that God is omnipresent, right? He is everywhere. But the same God that is in Israel today is in Johannesburg today. He's with my parents in Texas today. He covers the world every place at all time, right? God is omnipresent. It would not be good for us if God had to dwell in the temple because the temple was destroyed. And even as they are looking at the temple... There's two verses, I think, that are very important. The first one is 1 Kings 8.27. And this is Solomon's prayer as he dedicates the temple. He's built the temple. Now they're going to open it up and dedicate it. And he says this. Will God indeed live on earth? Even the heavens, the highest heavens, cannot contain you, much less this temple I have built. Solomon is saying, this temple is amazing, and I built it exactly how you told me to, and we expect you to be here. But yet, the highest heavens can't contain you. What is this little building? Right there? What is this doghouse? Like, you're God, right? And then Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, and I'm reading this again because of, or I'll just, well, let me read 1 and 2. But two kind of ends, I think, in pointing in this text to Stephen. Isaiah says, this is what the Lord says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house could you possibly build for me? What place could be my home? 
My hand has made all these things, and so they all came into being. This is the Lord's declaration. And then he says this, I will look favorably on this kind of a person who is humble, submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. When I was reading this verse to get ready to preach this morning, that for me summed up who Stephen is. If I had to say three things about Stephen from this text, it would be that he was humble, that he was submissive, that he was in the spirit, and that he trembled at the word of God. As Stephen is defending the gospel before the spiritual leaders of that day, that is what I think we see. The Old Testament heroes, the prophets, they never believed God was going to be confined to a building, let alone an amazing building like the temple. God appears, God speaks, God sends, God promises, God punishes, God rescues. And he does all of that in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, at the Red Sea, in the wilderness, uh, in, in Jerusalem. He, he continually does those things. He continually works. There is no way, Stephen is saying, that he can be confined to a tent or a building. So Stephen has made his defense. He's made his point. And you would think, wow, that was pretty impressive. (laughs) There are times preachers do weird things in sermons. I'm trying hard not to do that today. It's as if Stephen takes a breath and says, if you understand that, you'll know you have it all wrong. Like he is in their face, right? He's saying everything you believe is not true. It's not completely true. Stephen is saying in verses 50 and 53, the blessing is not the land. The blessing is not the building. The blessing is not the rules or the regulations. You are the ones that don't understand. You are the ones that are confused. You should be on trial. You should be asking answering the questions that I ask. Peter sums it up. Let me read 50 through 53 for you. All right, 51. You stubborn people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors fail to persecute? They killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You received the law as ordained by angels, but you did not obey it. I don't think I've ever finished a sermon that poignantly. He takes them on and then blames their parents as well. If you really want to make somebody mad, say, and your mama. You know, it's not not just you, but you and your mama and your grandma. He says, you are stubborn and you oppose the Holy Spirit. Your ancestors were persecuting and killing God's messengers. They missed Jesus. They missed the righteous one. More than that, you betrayed him and you murdered him. You receive the law, but you don't even obey it. Wow. Wow. And I think verses 51 and 55 kind of sum up the whole sermon. Verse 51, he says, you are always opposing the Holy Spirit. Not occasionally you get it wrong, but you are continually fighting against the Holy Spirit. And we know in Ephesians 4.30, we are told not to grieve the Holy Spirit. So we see the religious leaders that Stephen is talking to are continually opposing the Holy Spirit. But if you want to know who Stephen is, in verse 55, it says he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Last week, you learned in Acts 6, verse 3, he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And in Acts 6, 5, he was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of guy I want to be. I want to be full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and full of faith. I was talking to somebody two weeks ago. And they were like, Kurt, if you could grow or mature or do something, what would you do? And I said, I want to have more faith. 
I'll be honest, there's a lot of really difficult things that we've seen recently in downtown Joburg. A lot of spiritual darkness, a lot of spiritual oppression, a lot of spiritual warfare. And I just like, Lord, help me have more faith. Don't help me give in. Help me, help me represent you better. Fill me with the Spirit. Give me more faith and wisdom, and let's go do what we need to do in those parts of the town. The reason I was trying to point to Jesus as we went through the text today can be summarized in Luke 24. If you remember, after Jesus rose from the dead, he talked to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They were frustrated. They're like, hey, man, this this looked like it was going well, and now it's a disaster. and, And it says this. Luke 24, 27, it says, Jesus began with Moses and all the prophets and explained to them all the passage of Scripture about himself. Man, I wish I could have been there. I mean, can you imagine walking through the Old Testament with Jesus and he said, that, that verse is about me, that verse is about me, that verse is about me. That would have been a long walk, Right? I mean, just flying through this as quickly as I could today, we continue to learn about Jesus. uh, That he, like Abraham, he was sent to a foreign place to live as a foreigner. As Isaac and Jacob and the patriarchs, that he was sold for silver coins by someone near him. We think about Joseph. Jesus was left for dead and yet became our rescuer. When we think about Moses, we see Jesus as our... uh, Oh, Jesus hears our, sees our oppression and hears our groans. Jesus was rejected by his people, and yet he led them out of danger to a better place. And then we see in the tabernacle, the tent, the temple, Jesus is Emmanuel. Jesus is God with us. In John chapter 5, Verses 39 and 40, it says this, You study the scriptures, for you suppose them to have eternal life, yet they testify about me, but you are not willing to come to me to have life. In verse 46, he says, For if you believed in Moses, you would believe in me, for it was about me that he wrote. What a, what a perfect summary to Acts chapter 7. Jesus is saying, Moses wrote about me. It's all about me. And I want you to come to me. So that's how we can respond. Unfortunately, the religious rulers became more and more furious. They became enraged. They grind, ground their teeth. And at this point in time, we see Stephen full of the Holy Spirit. His character is so easy for us to see. And his last words are filled with faith and courage. Stephen sees two things. He sees God's glory, right? The interesting thing about that is God's glory is predominantly associated with Israel. Because of creation, because of the Torah, because of the Exodus, because of the temple. And yet they completely missed it. And the other thing that Stephen sees is Jesus standing. Now, I used to think Jesus was going to come down there and settle this. This is like some kind of WWE thing. It's like God's like, no, no, hold on. Don't, don't go. Don't go. Right? I don't think that's really it. Although I think it's kind of cool. Every place in the Bible we see Jesus, he is sitting at the right hand of God, except this one place. And I think it's for us to understand, similar to how Ph.D. students, when they get their doctorate, the the faculty stands in their honor. Right? When I got a master's, nobody cared about me. I just walked by and grabbed my paper and kept going. Right? But if you get a Ph.D., (laughs) then the faculty stands. Like, you're one of us. Glad to have you here. You're amazing. Um, The other thing that I think is important about this is that he is welcoming Stephen into his house. When you welcome people, when people come to your house, do you sit on your couch and they can just kind of walk in the room and make themselves at home? No, you stand up, you go to the gate, you welcome them, you bring them in. 
I think that's what Jesus is doing. Stephen is about to die. And Jesus is waiting for him. Jesus is aware of everything that's going on. This, this verse is so comforting to me. I, I know that, that Jesus is omniscient. I know he knows everything. But, but this is like personally omniscient. He looks down and he sees Stephen about to die and he stands up to welcome him. That's amazing. Jesus is screaming at the top of his lungs, well done, my good and faithful servant. And in his death, Stephen is looking at Jesus. Now, I don't know when I'm going to die. I don't know when you're going to die. But I hope that when you do it, you're looking at Jesus as that happens. And as all of this happens, they throw him out of the city and stone him. And as they do that, they see a man named Saul who is, has the coats of the people that are actively stoning Stephen thrown at his feet. And in Acts 22, Paul gives his testimony of that day. But we sum up this story in Acts 7.59 because it kept, they keep stoning Stephen. That's one side. The other side is Stephen keeps praying. So they keep stoning, he keeps praying. They keep stoning, he keeps praying. And he prays two specific things. He says, Father, receive me. Receive me. And the other thing he says is, Father, forgive them. He obviously was a disciple that spent time with Jesus, hearing about Jesus and how Jesus died on the cross because Jesus prayed the exact same two things while he was dying for our sins. Amen. Jesus begged his father not to hold their sin against him. And then it says, Stephen dies. He falls asleep. I want to ask you five questions quickly. How does Stephen's life and death encourage you? I, I thank you for the opportunity to preach today because I got to dwell in this text more than I have ever before. And it really did help me to learn some of those things. How does it help you to know that Jesus is watching you personally? How does it help you to know that Jesus is not restricted to geography? If that's true, we'd all want to live as close to Israel as we can, right? Like if Jesus has to be, if God has to be in the temple, then we want to be as close to the temple as we can be. How is it a blessing that the worship of God is not restricted to Jerusalem? But if you don't do anything else today as you think through this text, I want to ask you to do this. I want you to think about the Holy Spirit. And I want you to think linearly where are you on the Holy Spirit? Because it really seems like in this story there's two people. There are the religious leaders of Israel who are always opposing and grieving the Spirit. And then the other hand is Stephen who is full of the Spirit. Where are you on that line? Where do you want to be on that line? And how can you get there? Let, let me pray. Father, I declare that you are omnipresent. That you are in this very place at this very time. Not because we deserve your presence, but because you love us. You love us so much that you send your son to die for us. Father, I thank you for this story that, that teaches us so many truths about the Old Testament, that teaches us how to defend our faith to people that are hostile. It teaches us how to live a godly life like a man, Stephen. Father, this, this text also asks questions of us, deep questions of us. But none more obvious to me than what is my life with the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that in no way would I ever be opposing your spirit.
or grieving your spirit. Father, for the times that I have, I beg you to forgive me. Father, I pray even now that all of us would be filled with your spirit as we leave this place. Father, as life in some way has drained some of the spirit from us, Father, we pray that you would fill us afresh. Father, as we go out, I pray that you would give us wisdom so that we can defend the gospel well. Not to defend ourselves or whatever, but just to make much of Jesus. Father, I thank you for that text from the road to Emmaus where Jesus shows in Moses and the prophets all the things that are about him. Father, I thank you for giving us your word that we would know about your son. And Father, I thank you for giving us your son. May he be glorified and praised this morning as we celebrate the life and death of Stephen. Father, help us to be more like him, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.